Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Voice of Authority, brought to you by Carter Jonas and GLE and London Square Partners. My name's Toby Fox. I'm the Managing Director at 3Fox, the marketing agency for councils. And our job is to keep our network of councils and developers and investors and their influencers and advisors connected. Now, uh, we're going to be doing that in just a few short weeks on September the 8th at Sitematch at The Shard in London. And details for that event, which brings councils and the development community together in person, are going into the chat shortly. But today we're continuing our series of interviews with public sector leaders and senior officers to give our network a deeper understanding of the vision for a place uh, and how it will grow and evolve by hearing from the people shaping that vision and what makes them tick. You can find an archive of hundreds of written and recorded interviews at thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. The format of these live interviews is simple. We ask our Voice of Authority seven questions. The first three will cover their wish list and the challenges that they must overcome to deliver that list and the partners that they're seeking to help them. And then we'll ask our Voice of Authority what constitutes good development and who or what has shaped their views on growth and development and the watershed moments in their life and career that have led them to our screens today. And then finally, we'll ask what they get up to outside of work. What are the interests and the passions that drive and motivate them and perhaps shape those views and ambitions? And we're delighted that today those questions are all going to be put to the new cabinet member for planning and economic development at the City of Westminster, Councillor Jeff Barraclough. Now, the victory for Labour in Westminster, the first time it's been held by any party other than Conservatives, was perhaps the biggest surprise of the May local election, certainly in London. And among its pledges, Labour promised to end the cosy business as usual relationship with developers and to make building new council social and lower rent homes the council's top policy priority. Local issues influence the vote too, especially the future of Oxford Street and friction between residents and the tourist economy and the troubled £6 million Marble Arch Mound. So how are these going to is issues going to shape Councillor Barraclough's approach to his portfolio of economic development, of town planning and planning policy, place shaping and digital innovation in the public realm? We're going to spend the next hour finding out. So let's begin, Councillor Barraclough, Jeff, uh, by asking what are the three things at the top of your wish list for Westminster? Well, uh, first, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Um, it, it's not often um, I get a chance to speak to such an august uh, august audience. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many um, attendees on the um, uh, as participants. Uh, and indeed, I, I recognise like one or two of the names there as well. So uh, if you do know me, um, uh, thanks for uh, thanks thanks for joining. Um, you asked for for three things. Um, as a new administration, um, the priorities are um, we want to deliver uh, more affordable housing. Uh, we want faster action on on climate change, uh, and we want to give residents um, a stronger voice uh, in in their in their communities and in their cities. And um, I think, as you observed in the opening remarks, um, that's one reason. Uh, why I'm here uh, is that the previous administration uh, had, had lost touch with many of the um, resident communities uh, within Westminster, and um, there was a general feeling that it was a, uh, a, a time time for change. Thanks, Jeff. Um, let's just unpack those slightly for for a couple of minutes. So, on affordable housing, the first of those commitments, um, what it, what is your intention? Well, how how much affordable housing do you intend to deliver, and and how do you plan to do it? Well, I think we look at things uh, slightly differently in that um, as uh, you know, Labour um, uh, Labour candidates uh, and Labour, Labour activists, we spend a lot of time knocking on doors uh, and we see the extent of the housing crisis uh, in central London, particularly the, the, the overcrowding uh, and the number of people um, in, in temporary accommodation, uh, often temporary accommodation being sent to, you know, other, the other side of London, away from their family support networks, away from where their children go to school and so on. So um, I think we would regard success uh, not in numerical terms of, you know, new house, new houses, new homes built, but in terms of how much of a dent we can make in uh, in our housing waiting list. I, I think from memory, we've got, a, we've got about 2,000 families living in uh, temporary accommodation at the moment. So, I mean, making a dent in that, I think, would be uh, would be a success. And on climate change, how, what, what are your intentions there? What's the what, what's the ambition? Well, so the, the ambition um, of the council uh, is to be net zero by 
by 2030. Uh, and I think you know, there, are, there are plans that we inherited to deliver that. Um, some of those plans are maybe not as well, well uh, work through or as comprehensive as we had hoped they were going to be. Um, but that's clearly a, a focus on our own activities, particularly how we can uh, deliver uh, a significant carbon reduction in Westminster's own housing stock, roughly 20,000 homes that we're directly responsible for uh, as a freeholder uh, or, or on, our, on our housing estates. Uh, and then for the wider wider city, because the council only accounts for you know, 3% of emissions in, in Westminster, um, we play a convening role to uh, catalyze uh, change and catalyze in investment. And most, most of the um, the carbon emissions in Westminster are from the commercial property sector. That, that's by far the most important single um, single item. And actually, it's been very heartening working with uh, or initial meetings with the um, with the greater states, the large landowners, uh, with the business improvement districts, and so on. That that's very much their priority too. So we want to help people and help everybody achieve those um, uh, achieve those ambitions because it's clear that. Um, investors are demanding that the property companies whose whose debt or equity they hold um, have a serious plan to get to near zero and their tenants also uh, you know if they're going to have offices they need offices that help them deliver their overall business uh, co2 reduction targets so uh, i think we're pushing an open door uh, with the commercial property sector uh, the residential sector i think is much harder because uh, of the misalignment of, of, of incentives between uh, freeholders that own blocks of flats, uh, the leaseholders that own the flats themselves, and often you know, the tenants who are, are renting from the leaseholders. So I think that's going to be more of a challenge. Um, but there's a couple of things coming up, which I will, I will, you know, uh, would like to take this opportunity of highlighting. So uh, one of them is uh, we're going to be launching what we call the Sustainable City Charter. Um, which we're going to do uh, in conjunction with the uh, Westminster Property Association. Uh, and that's a voluntary code of conduct uh, for uh, property owners uh, and tenants uh, to sign up to, to commit them to, to net zero and, and some other you know, um, you know, subsidiary actions, uh, freight consolidation and uh, uh, other good stuff. So uh, we would encourage everybody to, uh, to, that's out for consultation now, but we'll want to get through that to, uh, to sign up because that will really help uh, deliver a kind of kind of mark, if you like, uh, for, for those buildings. Um, in the residential, um, well, actually residential and commercial, uh, we're setting up a, a retrofit task force uh, with representatives from the uh, some of the major landowners. We've got Grosvenor on board. Uh, we've got Notting Hill Genesis, one of the large housing associations, uh, and a bunch of others to try and um, advise us as a council on how best we can help them um, with planning policy uh, and other, other areas to um, retrofit their estates. Because we did notice, again, knocking on lots of doors during the, during the campaign, uh, there are thousands of our residents living in drafty old flats um, where they're spending a huge amount of money on heating. Uh, and also, obviously, it's very bad for the environment too. Um, so lots of people in Westminster, I mean, you, you, you wouldn't know this if you didn't live here, there's lots of people living in in in, in pretty unswanky accommodation in listed buildings, yeah. uh, for example. Um, and, and we need to make sure we're you know um, helping as much as we can to um, to remove all the excuses not to invest that, that landlords that landlords um, landlords might have. And for example, we're going to publish a couple of guidebooks shortly uh, on how to upgrade windows. Uh, again, in conservation areas with listed buildings, because that comes up a lot. How do we double glaze? How do we um, draft proof and so on? So that 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 should be out in the next couple of days, I hope. And also one on how to go about uh, fitting air source heat pumps, uh, which again is is a um, very much what lots of building owners want to do. Uh, but clearly, conservation area listed buildings. How do you go about? Um, how, how do you go about doing that? So, I mean, there's a lot, lot of things I'm hoping we can do to make things easier for people uh, to do what what they want to do anyway. Thanks, Jeff. And then the final part of your wish list was around um, getting uh, local people more engaged with uh, with, um, the, with with the policies of the council and, and uh, in in helping you decide what to do. And as I understand it, you've 
you've got a sort of listening program at the moment. So, so we're not expecting enormous amounts of, of change immediately. What, what, we're, what we're expecting is the development of policy over the next few months. Is that, is that right? How, how, how quickly are you, are you moving? Well, I mean, sorry, I mean, in general terms, the new administration is not a revolution. Uh, no, this, this, is, this, is, um, this is evolution. Uh, and in many of the areas, such as affordable housing and climate change, uh, the previous administration had expressed uh, a direction of travel. They just hadn't gone anywhere. So uh, you know, we, we just want to we want to implement Im implement a bunch of plans that weren't actually implemented and go faster and go quicker and go larger. Um, so um, the direction of travel you know, is not a three sixty degree U turn, but it's you know we're moving out of second gear into you know hopefully fourth, right? Put foot on the gas in a number of areas. As regards residents. Um, you know, we don't shy away from the fact that we're elected by the people who live in Westminster, and those are the people that we uh, we primarily uh, we primarily serve. And the council, this council, have got a whole series of consultations badly wrong uh, on a whole variety of areas, um, and we are going to put in place um, a much earlier system of cons consultation and try and do it properly first time and that that will be much quicker um over the long run and we'll actually manage to get things done so if we take soho as a good example right so um there's a soho neighborhood plan that's been adopted uh, which is terrific uh the uh the council uh wanted to back that plan with public realm investment and we still want to do that um but the program which is called the Vision for Soho, which was launched to do that, uh, ended, ended up being opposed by the residents of Soho. They had no trust in, in the process. They had no confidence that their views are being listened to. Um, and and um, so we, we've had to um, pause it uh, and pause it pending. Um, we are going to start doing a whole series of environmental monitoring of traffic, of air, of, uh, of noise. Um, which we're going to do in conjunction with the local local residents, so they tell us where the where the noise monitoring points need to be and so on. Uh, so we do get an evidence base upon which we can then start to build proposals to invest in the public realms. Everybody wants you know less traffic and you know, more trees and you know wider pavements and all that kind of stuff, but um, you can't do that if you haven't got the consent of the people who live in those streets. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, is, um, you know, it's going to be critical. Well, and let's let's um, segue into uh, the second part of the, the interview, if we may, then, Jeff, um, which is around the challenges you face in delivering your your wish list. And, and I guess one of the chief challenges is exactly that is bringing local people with you on 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 the journey. And I would like to um, focus, if I may, on the sort of Oxford Street situation, your, your intentions for Oxford Street and, and of course, the big fuss that's that has been over the, the Marble Arch Mound and, and which was an ele electoral issue for you. Um, how do you intend to, to, to bring people with you on the journey? And how do you intend to get across the message that sometimes tough decisions are going to have to be made? You know, it is going to be expensive to do um, to, to address climate change. People are going to to perhaps feel that in their in their pockets, as we're experiencing now with the, the cost of fossil fuels going up and, and no ready alternative. Well, so th that's quite a, you know, a, a quite a broad series of questions. But I mean, let me take Oxford Street first. Right? Yeah. So uh, I think everybody, everybody agrees that, uh, you know, Oxford Street should be uh, the nation's premier uh, shopping street. It's um, 1.8 kilometres long, centre of the biggest city in Europe. And it's not, it's not right. Uh, now, we know that the mix of, um, of commercial needs to change. So... You know, there, there isn't really demand for 1.8 kilometers of, of, of retail. And so we need a mixture of, of, of leisure, uh, of hospitality uh, and cultural uses on that street. And we're very, very keen to support that. I mean, um, so that, that mix has to change. The previous administration uh, with that Oxford Street District program uh, had burnt through 35 million pounds in two to three years and delivered um, the mound, uh, the photography quarter, which is um, some nice paving on the uh, service road called Ramilly Street, just behind um, Oxford Street. 
Um, and that's basically it. And one of the reasons why they hadn't lived anything, despite spending all the money, was because they weren't engaging with um, with, with, with not, not just the residents, but also, you know, as we discovered, the, the stakeholder community and the, the business community in the West End either. Uh, and that led to the proposals to block Oxford Circus with these piazzas, which was going to be, a, um, I think, a £14 million scheme. So £40 million pounds of you know, borrowed public money uh, to block Oxford Circus. Um, and no consultation, because this is going to be forced through under emergency powers, the COVID and emergency powers. And it's no surprise that there's a revolt uh, amongst the like local residents and others, because some big things are being done without uh, without any consultation. So um, I've cancelled that. We're not we're not going to block Oxford Street. Uh, we're not going to pedestrianise Oxford Street. That's not the right thing to do at the moment. What we are going to do uh, is launch a, a much more comprehensive program um, for the street, which will include uh, significant public realm investment in the street itself. I might add, of that £35 million pounds in Oxford Street District, only 70,000 had been spent on plans for the street, which we, we think has got the whole thing the wrong way around, right? Um, they, we've got to fix the street. So that includes public realm, but also um, we're going to take, we are already taking much more assertive action on candy stores, uh, as you've seen in the newspapers. Um, we are working with... Um, we're working to um, expand our program of, of pop-ups so there will be more uh, more of those available if landlords want to work with us because uh, we can remit two-thirds of the business, re business rates for an empty property if you come and work with us uh, and if anybody has an empty property they're looking for a pop-up to go in we can help so please uh, uh, get in touch with me uh, meet me and the team and we, um, we're keen to look at more aggressive options if, if necessary. So again, the previous administration wouldn't look at uh, compulsory purchase orders. Um, no, we will, uh, if people come with the right, uh, right proposals. Um, no, very happy to take more assertive action if there are landowners that are blocking, um, blocking change. So we're gonna take a more holistic approach to it. Um, to, to that street. But just going back to your point about, about residents, uh, to give you a, a, you know, a very good example. So uh, the team are driving around this morning uh, and they are removing uh, dumped e-bikes from the streets. Okay. Right? E-bike rental is not authorised in, West, in Westminster. We're very happy to engage with the e-bike rental companies and organise something, but up until now, they won't talk to us. So residents are complaining bitterly that the pavements are blocked. If you've got limited mobility, if you're in a, in a wheelchair, you're pushing a pushchair, um, these things are a menace. So you no, know, we're, we're driving around picking them up and um, I'm not quite sure what happens to them next, but that's the kind of assertive pro-resident action that I think you'd expect your council to take. Yeah, but with, with with respect, that's good stuff, and and uh, you know would be universally popular, I imagine, with 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 residents. But there's some harder stuff as well, isn't there? So so uh, we, you, you mentioned climate change as as as, as top of the wish list, uh, addressing climate change. That is going to be difficult to affect without people changing their lifestyles in ways that they're going to find uncomfortable. So I wonder how you're going to convince people to come on that journey with you. But how is it uncomfortable to uh, put, put in double glazing and have a warmer home? It's going to be expensive. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, clearly, um, we would, wouldn't be uncomfortable, would it? I mean, I, I, I think um, there's, 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 at the moment, with, with the cost of energy, uh, you've got opportunities to um, but both save money and um, live in a warmer, you know, a warmer home and hit the, hit the climate change. Uh, needs as well. So um, yes, double glazing costs money, but long term your bills, uh, your bills, your bills will uh, will decline. Uh, what we are going to do, uh, we're going to issue local climate bonds. So um, local people, well, back anybody can um, uh, can invest in um, in local in bonds that will in, will will start um, building local schemes to reduce CO two emissions, and and, and uh, that will be an alternative source of financing. But yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, you invest to save. That that's a fairly well known uh, business proposition, isn't it? 
in, in some quarters, yeah. Um, what about decarbonisation? So, so being really specific on, on an aspect of, of climate change, um, you mentioned the, uh, the need to decarbonise uh, council housing stock. Um, again, it's a really expensive um, uh, uh, operation to, to conduct. So how are you going to balance that with the challenge of um, central funding, you know, reduced uh, funding available for local authorities? Where are you going to find the money to decarbonise? Uh, and, and where do you stand on decarbonisation versus refurbishment? Um, so the first part of the question, I'm not sure I can answer. Um, so I, I think um, we'll need to bring one of my colleagues on to, on to the next one of these. Okay. Uh, um, we, fair we, enough, Jeff. I mean, it's a, it, I'm, I'm asking very broad we're, questions, we're, we're, so I appreciate it. I think it's fair. We, we, we're very fortunate in actually our new, um, our new intake of uh, Labour councillors that we, we do have a, a, a green finance expert who's our deputy cabinet member for, uh, for climate change. He'd be a great person to have, to have on this because he, he can give you the whole list of uh, over how we can finance all this stuff. But We'd love to. I, I, yeah. I'd be straying too far outside my area and I'd probably get something badly wrong if I, if I start busking on it. Um, your second bit was about... About, um, about um, demolition versus refurbishment specifically. Um, yeah. well, uh, and that was actually a question that came in from, from one of our viewers, Rob Edwards at, at TFL. Well, and I think I, I'm, I'm sure it will. So, um, the, so the current city plan requires the, um, the planning committee to... Uh, take into account the, 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 the whole life carbon assessment when they decide whether uh, to approve a new building. And um, I mean, there's, there's a test case at the moment, uh, which I think will be on uh, top of mind for many people on this call, which is Marks and Spencer's new store yep. in Oxford Street, where they want to demolish three buildings, including their current, uh, their current Marble Arch store, and build a much larger building. And um, with a pretty significant um, whole life carbon um, mm. Im impact. And that's been called in by the planning inspector or by, by the Secretary of State who ordered the planning inquiry, um, which is going to last for eight days. It's a very significant um, investigation going on. That's going to be in October. Uh, it's in our office here in uh, City Hall. So please come along and, and observe. And I think that's going to be really helpful because there are. You know, uh, with any new building or any planning application, there's a balance between you know, how compliance with the various policies and the harm it does and, and, and the good it brings. Clearly, in terms of investing in Oxford Street, improving the retail offer um, and, and jobs and so on, um, this new building will be a positive step. On the negative, um, there's a heritage impact actually, but also beyond heritage, there is a lot of CO2. And yeah. although the new building is more efficient than the previous one, I think it's 12 or 13 years before you catch up. And you know, if there's a climate emergency now. Um, so that's that's I think I think one uh, very important point: how you how you how you balance that. And so I, I, I welcome having the planning planning inquiry, and um, everybody has an interest is going to be able to come on and and and, um, um, and say their piece, and we look forward to uh, to seeing that. I, meanwhile, we have uh, we are going to examine and review that particular policy in our city plan, and uh, the team are putting together some evidence at the moment to work out how we how we're going to do that because um, it, 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 it's it's quite a bold step, and we need to make sure we're supported by uh, by, by the evidence, and we're I'm, I'm confident we can be able to get it through the uh, uh, the planning inspector at the end. But yeah, I, I think it's. A very legitimate question we need to be asking ourselves is that balance between um, you know, releasing carbon today, saving it tomorrow, and how, how useful a new building is. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to move on to the, the third part of our interview, which is around partnerships and, and, and the sorts of partners you'd like to engage with, the sorts of values that you, you want to share with partner organisations. Um, and I'd like, I'd like to start off. Um, in, in a sort of slightly inverse way by asking how many of your ambitions or, or how much of your ambition can be met through the council and its own teams and its own companies uh, and how much are you relying on, on outside help? Well, I think in, in, in terms of housing, the uh, at the moment, the private sector is not that interested in building housing in the centre of London. And therefore, in terms of affordable housing, um, which is normally delivered as a you know, a, a percent. You know, there's, a, there's a percent attached to um, private sector development. Um, 
that it's not going to be, you know, whatever the percent number is, it's not going to be in terms of number of units, it's not going to be very big uh, in, in the near term. And in fact, we've seen uh, since, since Brexit, since 2016, the number of major planning applications uh, in Westminster has halved compared to the normal, normal run rate. So I mean, just generally, uh, things are relatively quiet. And if you add the retrofit new build debate as well, um, plus we lost the mixed use policy, which was um, a, a planning policy which required office developments to pro also provide affordable housing. That planning inspector um, ruled that out um, subject to the coming in of Class E, um, which um, is probably a little, little bit slightly too much detail for this call. Um, but anyway, we, we can come back to it a little bit later. But anyway, so the, the upshot is I don't anticipate a huge amount of private sector uh, residential development coming through um, in, 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 in the near term. That that does come through, we are going to insist it sticks to our policy, by the way. So, you know, that we'll need to live, deliver affordable. Um, so, yeah, um, we're going to have to build uh, on our own land. And there's two very large estate regeneration projects which are um, in train uh, just to, to a greater or lesser extent at Ebury uh, and at Church Street and Nissan Grove. And we are looking at the moment about how we change the balance of um, the balance of uh, homes to be to have more uh, bias towards uh, homes at social rent in those developments. How how far would you push that bias potentially? How far would you like that bias to be pushed? Uh, so we uh, the um, the previous administration had a policy of uh, forty percent special, sixty percent intermediate. Um, we'd like to we'd like to reverse that. Um, so it's still obviously still building intermediate, but you know, a bit less and but more, uh, but much more uh, homes at social rent um, and shared ownership always comes up. Um, mm. yeah. We don't think that shared ownership is appropriate for um, for Westminster. Um, you own twenty five percent of the asset, you get a hundred percent of the liability. Uh, it's a risky proposition at the best of times in the best of locations, but for the the cash outlay people are required to pay here, um, I, I, I you know I think it will be mis-selling to um, recommend anyone to buy a shared ownership flat in uh, in central London. And and what, how about um, the financing of that program? Because if you're not building for private sale and, and cross subsidising, what what's the policy there? Well, um, that's another question. I'm afraid we're going to have to bring one of my colleagues on to answer. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the details of that yet. Not to worry, Jeff. Well, let's, let's let's expand it a bit then and ask about the the pledge to end the cosy business as usual relationship with with developers and how that impacts on um, your view of of the sorts of partners that you need and 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 the relationship that you want to have with the private sector and where where you feel they can help. Well, I mean, the the, the, the private sector is absolutely. Uh, key to the future success of um, of London. Look, I, I'm um, uh, I spent my career in the uh, in the private sector. This is this is my first brush with um, uh, with the public sector or you know, um, local authorities. Um, so, absolutely, um, they, we, we for the central London to thrive, we need the business community um, to thrive, and we're very keen to support. Uh, economic development. We've got a view as to how we share the fruits of the economic development, and we want to make sure our residents get uh, access to the um, to the good jobs um, and fulfilling well-paid employment that uh, is generated in the centre of London. But absolutely need to grow the cake and to make sure that um, uh, the wet West End is fully recovered from um, uh, from, from COVID. Um, I mean, you ask in terms of how we um, you know, deal with um, uh, the cosy relationship. So, um, I mean, clearly in the past, um, the Westminster Conservatives have been very close to uh, the development industry uh, and the Robert Davis scandal, many of you familiar on, the, on this call, um, where the alignment of the council's interests and that of the development community were, were, were basically the same. And we're determined that we keep things uh, at a very, you know, a, 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 a very business-like, but ultimately separate um, relationship. So um, we've separated the role of um, planning planning cabinet member, which is which is me, who is responsible for uh, for planning policy, including explaining uh, uh, planning policy. 
uh, and the chair of the planning committee, uh, Councillor Ruth Bush, uh, who, dis who adjudicates, and her, her committee adjudicates on whether an application uh, is conforming with the plan. If it doesn't, does it bring sufficient other, other benefits? So keeping those very separate. Uh, and largely it'll be me meeting uh, developers, which I've already done, and large landowners. We meet them in the office, we have an officer with us take, taking minutes, and we have a perfectly business-like um, conversation. Um, but I, I, as an example of how things used to be, as an opposition councillor, I found out about changes in, in Westminster's cabinet through an email we used to get from the Westminster Property Association. We found out from them before we found out uh, from the council itself. Um, so th that gives the indications to how close things used to be. Now, we're still um, good business partners, I hope, with the WPA. Uh, we meet them regularly, working together on a number, a number of areas, but um, not that close. And, and what about um, the relationship with other boroughs? How do you see working with other boroughs to, to deliver your, your ambitions, your wish list? So we, um, we're we very pragmatic and very outcome focused. So we're not, um, uh, so I mean, a good, good example is, uh, as some of you may know, um, Westminster is in a bi-borough relationship with Kensington and Chelsea for, the, for social services and legal services and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, you know, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not going to, uh, not going to break that up. Still very happy to collaborate with KNC on a whole variety of you know, operational, operational areas. Um, we will, this is the, a positive thing, is, is that we're able to collaborate much more closely with the GLA. I think, again, the previous administration um, had a, um, you know, found it difficult politically. And um, you know, we're, we're very pleased we can, um, we can iron, iron that out. And I think in, in terms of the, um, the central activity zone, um, you know, we have been working with Central London Forward, which is the group of the, you know, the, the, the central London uh, local mm -hmm. authorities um, on, on a programme on the future of the, uh, of, of the CARES. But I mean, look, looking at that, I think we are going to need to work much more closely with Camden, uh, because I, I think Camden and Westminster really share a, 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 joint, um, you know, a, a joint responsibility, but also a joint set of issues to address um, uh, around the future of the camps. I guess Camden, Westminster and the city are probably the three that need to spend most time talking to each other. And what's your specific ask of, of the mayor at the, at the moment? And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of the, the housing programme you've talked about and, and, and how you're funding it. Are, are you looking to the GLA for, for, for significant increases of funding for housing? Um, I, I would expect so, but uh, it's, that's, uh, I'm sorry, I've got to say again, that's not, that's not my area. Okay. Uh, and um, you know, there's been a whole lot of stuff going on in the last uh, three months as we've been dropped into local government. And uh, I probably am not up to speed with my colleagues as much as I should be. Jeff, I, I, I don't mean to, to highlight that gap at, at all. And we'll look forward to welcoming colleagues on the um, on, on future interviews so we can explore that, explore that further. What about um, your ask of government? I mean, there's planning reform um, in the system. What are your expectations of that? And, and what would you like to see come out? Uh, so we would like to see more power returned to local authorities to uh, determine what happens in their own area. So uh, the, you know, uh, we applied for an Article 4 direction uh, for the whole of the uh, uh, Central Activity Zone, um, not just us, the other local authorities in London did as well. Uh, and we've all been knocked back to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, and we don't think it's um, really up to the, you know, a, a government minister to decide uh, whether uh, you know a retail premises on Horse Ferry Road can be converted into a, a flat or not? I think we're, we're, we're best qualified to uh, to, to um, determine that. So that's disappointing. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to the uh, overall planning policy. Uh, clearly, Robert Jemnick's proposals are dead. Uh, Michael Gove uh, looked like he was going to bring forward some things that were uh, generally look more, much more sensible. Um, I guess they're dead now as well. Um, we don't know who's going to be in charge uh, of DLAC um, uh, later later in the year. So I'm, you know, we'll have to address that when we uh, when we come to it. But more broadly, I mean, there, there are some clear asks from um, from central London to government. Right, one of them um, we need TfL properly funded because a rapid transit system is essential to the functioning of the modern city. Uh, we need buses, we need tubes, and we need them to be affordable to the people who live and work here. That's probably the biggest ask we've got. But there's one or two other things. So we need uh, tax-free shopping reinstated. Uh, it's absurd that the government abolished that. It's the only country in the world, I think, that doesn't 
allow tourists the chance to get their VAT back. And it's really just handing a large section of the luxury goods industry to Paris, bonkers. Uh, and business rate reform. Um, the, if, if, from, uh, from memory, I think the HMV shop, which is a um, uh, turned to a candy store, has a business rate bill of four million pounds a year. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Um, the, so business taxation has to meet businesses' ability to pay. Otherwise, you get you know, rather negative and unintended consequences. So that's, that's quite a short wish list from government, but you know, obviously there's more. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. OK, um, I want to explore a little bit of, uh, of the context, your, your background, as it were. And I'd like to, to start um, by asking you about your influences. So who or what has influenced your views on, on planning and development and, and what makes a good place? So that, that's quite a difficult question to answer. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm conscious that the more I learned about um, planning and public realm, the less I know. So um, it's an area where um, the, 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 the great, great expertise, uh, people study for years, they do degrees and masters in planning and all, all, all the rest of it. Uh, we have a team uh, in City Hall of, of architects and ur urban planners uh, who design public realm schemes. Um, I'm happy to talk about outcomes, um, but um, it would be, um, you know, I, I don't stray into the territory of um, uh, you know, um, solutionizing uh, on, on this. So um, I, I'm reluctant to talk about people who've influenced me on that. What about um, your journey into politics in the first place? I mean, who, who was it that sort of gave you the idea that um, that, that might be something you'd enjoy and, and, and you feel you could contribute to? Uh, so it's uh, an unusual, uh, unusual story. But if you've got five minutes, yeah. um, so uh, back in two thousand, and I, I, so I, I never been involved in politics. Um, I never, never joined a political party uh, until I was in my, my late forties. Um, but my, the journey began, I guess, in two thousand and nine. Uh, I was marketing director of a, of a software company, which we, we sold. Um, uh, Till software and e-commerce software and merchandising software to retailers. So it was like our customers were Primark and Halfords and um, Mother Care and these kind of people. And our ops director got very excited about social media, which had just, just arrived at that, that point. And he was on me every single manager meeting, Jeff, we should do more social media. We've got this social media. That's how we're going to be selling in the future. And I'm like, I don't think Halfords is going to buy a new Till system because, you know, uh, they, they've seen some post on Facebook or whatever, but I thought the only way to prove the guy wrong was to start using it. So I opened a Twitter account for myself, which I still use actually talking about uh, retail technology and payment systems, which is my kind of professional area of expertise. And then I thought, oh, I, why don't people have been talking about hyperlocal as a, a really good use case for um, the social media. So I set up a Twitter account for my, my local area in Maida Vale uh, in, in West London. And because I'd already used my own name for this other Twitter account, I um, picked a pseudonym. I called myself Lord Elgin, uh, which is <laughs> with the street I live on is El Elgin Avenue. Um, and I began tweeting about the local area as this like character uh, who kind of developed a life of his own. And um, before I knew where it, where it was, um, that had become quite, quite a successful hyperlocal um, feed. And I began organizing events. So um, the, in local pubs, people would come along, have a drink. Um, people you know, I, I, people I, who followed me uh, were musicians or comedians and they'd come along with a little turn. And so we began doing this, this kind of thing. And the local politicians all turned out. So I met my local councillors. I met Karen Buck, who's an uh, excellent member of parliament in Westminster North. And then in 2014, I got made redundant um, from, a, this, from a different company by, by this point. And I had time on my hands. Um, they just opened a food bank on Elgin Avenue. So this is a street where flats, a, a flat will sell, a two bed flat will sell for a million pounds. And yet there are also people who haven't got enough to eat, which I see just as a kind of grotesque misallocation of, of resources. And I, I thought it's time to stop shouting at the TV and do something. So I, I joined the Labour Party to, to support Karen Buck. And um, then my, 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 my new colleagues were saying, Jeff, come on, you should stand for the council. So. Um, I stood for the council and um, four years later, um, we won an unexpected election result. And I find myself 
um, with a unexpected late career change into, into politics uh, for business, uh, which is which is very exciting. Um, but um, yeah, so um, uh, an anonymous Twitter account into, into, into real life is an unusual uh, political journey, I think. Who, who do you admire as politicians? You mentioned Karen. Who, who else do you admire as, as, as politicians? Well, I, I, I will call out Karen because mm. um, she has she can take the moral high ground, um, but she plays the ball, not the man. Uh, doesn't make it personal, and is able to be very effective by you know marshalling the evidence um, and doing the right thing but dials down the, um, the heat and political argument. And I think it's very important that we all, we all talk policy uh, and we stop being rude to each other. I think that, that's, just, um, you know, that's just unhelpful. And also it turns off uh, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the voters because uh, they just see people slagging each other off and it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's very cool. So I would definitely uh, highlight Karen. Um, very impressed with some of my local colleagues. So Paul de Moldenberg, many people know, who's on, on a, been on a 40-year journey in Westminster, um, and is now the city management uh, cabinet member for uh, city management, but doing pavement politics, right? You know, sorting stuff out for local people. That's what local politics is all about. Um, and I, I guess also, I've also been hugely impressed with Adam Hugg, our new leader, um, who's uh, taken to, again, unexpected uh, career change. Uh, but like a duck to water. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very confident that we're, you know, we're in good hands. And how are you balancing that, um, that, that sort of newfound political career with, um, with your work in the private sector? Are you, are you, still, are you still working in, uh, in IT? No, so, so I've, 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 I've had to give up a day job. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm currently a, a, a full-time cabinet member, uh, but I do need to... Um, um, I, I, I need to ma maintain uh, some kind of career in the private sector too, uh, so um, I will be looking at options of, um, you know, um, of things I can do. There might be some blogging uh, around payment systems coming up soon if anyone's interested in that, um, but, we'll, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. But it's, yeah, it's um, this particular portfolio is, is quite time consuming because yeah. um, there's a lot of people who um, I, need to, I need to meet and have regular conversations with, I and mean, we have 17 business improvement districts I'm responsible for. There's five more coming. Uh, there's a dozen neighborhood forums. Uh, there are um, the six or six or seven great estates. Uh, and, and they all quite rightly would like a monthly meeting with me, which is, I mean, um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's um, uh, the, the hours add up. Are they getting them? Is, is that is that your 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 sort of mo? Is is no, uh, no, monthly no, meeting with every group? I, I think we might make it quarterly, um, but so uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, um that, that that would be probably too much of a challenge uh even, even for the terrific people who manage who manage my diary here at city hall well look, you you mentioned the business improvement this is so that, that's probably a good way of segueing into another question i have which is what what you um feel makes a good place you know what's your benchmark for for good developments or or or, or development that you're most proud of um playing a part in in your in your your short career so far um, well, so that, that's that's again a slightly difficult question, yeah. um, particularly having been in, you know, having been in, in opposition. Um, and um, opposition spend most counters spend most of their time opposing developments, obviously, on behalf of residents. So it, it's uh, and I, and there's a couple of really real shockers that were proposed and made available that I was very pleased to help residents um, uh, help, help residents um, oppose. On on what um, grounds? Just 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 to. Get that that context. On what grounds did, were you pleased to to oppose those schemes? Because they were too big. I mean, we 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 had one uh, going to demolish a large garage and replace it with a uh, a block of flats that was eighteen inches away from the neighbours' windows. I mean, seriously. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we've got to get real about how large a development you can put into a, a small space in a you know in a, in a built up area, particularly in a conservation area. Um, so, I mean, you, you ask you know, about places that I've been um, about, about impressed with. Um, so the last few years, I've been spending quite a lot of time in Germany for work. Uh, and, um, and I love Berlin. Uh, I, think, I think Berlin works really well. 
it's very different to London in its, in its topography, you know, so it's more of a grid and the streets are much wider. So you can't you can't read across from uh, how Berlin has been organized. Um, and also spent a lot of time in Cologne, which is also very impressive because Cologne is not a particularly large city, but terrific rapid transit um, and very livable. Um, and, and you know, uh, the way they deal with all their Christmas markets is, uh, I, I, I think, wonderful, mm. the way you can walk around. Um, so I, I'm very, very impressed with, 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 with that, um, that kind of approach. I mean, in, in London, um, you know, I, I do like um, uh, what's happened at King's Cross. Mm. I think, um, within the, obviously, with the confines of what's, of what's possible, uh, they managed to preserve a lot of the heritage. Uh, they managed to update the uses to modern uses, get some culture, and, and um, they've got the St. Martins in there. Uh, every time you go, it's something different to look at, which is nice. And there's a huge number of good jobs uh, in, in that area, and it's a tremendous uh, transport interchange. So, um, you know, looking ahead, there's clearly um, Network Rail have got plans for Victoria. Mm -hmm. Uh, or got ideas of what might happen in Victoria, which I think uh, post COVID is probably time to pick up again. Uh, it'd be lovely to do something that people felt was fondly about um, in, in Victoria. But that took um, the King's Cross program. That's a that's a decade in the planning, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, the stuff takes forever, right? I mean, mm. it, it's um, um, even even a small road scheme, you know, it's going to take a couple of years. <laughs> so it's, it, 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 this is it. I mean, you know, we're, 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 um, London is a journey, not a destination. It's never going to be finished. Um, but you know, we just got to keep moving forward. Um, you mentioned um, the pedestrian sort of permeability of of Cologne, and I wonder if there is something that you you, you could translate over in your your approach to planning in in Westminster there and. I don't want to draw a, a, an exact line between that and, and Oxford Street, but you said Oxford Street is not going to be pedestrianised. It's not the right thing at the moment. So so is there a time at which you could see um, more pedestrianisation? Uh, and irrespective of that, what's your view on sort of active travel and, and your ability to, to to make more of it? in, in well, I think, I mean, if, if you look on the, on the, on the, on the continent, that's one reason why it's quite hard to read across, I think, is because... Uh, many cities maintain their medieval walls you know, well into the 19th century, so that when um, when they finally came down, they put ring roads essentially around the, uh, the old town. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that allowed you know, in the late 20th century to pedestrianise the centre of town uh, relatively easily. Um, I mean, London is very different uh, in, in, in the way that it's set out. So we are very keen to encourage um, walking uh, and cycling. Um, I don't like talking about pedestrians and cyclists or motorists because we're people and we do all. I, I, I walk a lot. I ride a bicycle. I also drive a car. I also take a bus. I take the train. Right, I'm, I'm all, all these people. So I don't think there are like cyclists and pedestrians are different people. They're the same people. Um, so we're looking at a variety of um, of schemes um, to encourage um, encourage that. I mean, and, and one of the I guess one of the things that I, you know, we're all going to be wrestling with uh, is how do you how do you repartition road space? So I think everybody's agreed that we can take space from the carriageway. I mean, in a, in a measured in gradual fashion, right? But how do you how do you if you're taking space out of the carriageway? How do you repartition that between cyclists, or people on bikes, people walking, and trees? Uh, because um, Again, um, we'd like to put more tree, a lot more trees in central London, but um, with the thickest of uh, servicing under most of the pavements, yeah. the best place for trees is actually to widen the pavements and put them in what's now the carriageway. So um, that debate, I think, is an interesting debate to have. And it's ongoing. This isn't a, you don't see that. You're not coming to that with preset ideas. Well, no, and that's the point about consultation, isn't it? Um, that, that, um, I'd much rather would much rather consult early and say, um, we you know we'd like to improve this street. Here you know here's the kind of things we could do, rather than say here's our plan. You know, um, what do you think? And we, uh, we, 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 our observation, at least with the politics in, in in Westminster, is we'll be able to deliver more and faster if we consult more thoroughly earlier. And at what point do you transition from consulting to to delivering? Do you think in 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 terms of the the sorts of interventions we've been talking about? 
Well, it depends on the scale of the intervention. Um, if we talk about Oxford Street, um, we would, um, uh, it, it's probably slight, slightly, slightly different because um, um, with the various things that have been going on, the, 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 there, are, there are plans that are slightly more advanced. Um, but I mean, I, I, I did, I not, I, it's a good question. I'm not sure there's a cookie cutter approach to it. Uh, although we are uh, going to going to beef up um, a, a, a small central team here that does consultations because I, I think I think it's a skill, um, and um, I think having it done by different uh, different teams in the council separately probably. You, you lose the ability to have a center of excellence. So, um, but I, I'm not sure I can ask you a question as, as, as to, you know, after, you know, um, you, you know, after people have agreed to read the stage one, you then, you know, put the foot on the gas. I'm not sure we can be quite so prescriptive. Fair enough, Jeff. Okay, let's return to your your sort of personal narrative, your your arc, uh, if if you like. Um, and I want to find out about the the watershed moments in your in your career. You've already talked about uh, about one in in the, the the moment at which you decided that politics was a uh, was a good thing for you. What what other sort of moments have have happened or, or um, uh, incidents or, or or people you've met that have led you to to our screens today? Well, I think that's probably uh, that's that's probably it. I mean, that's the <laughs> if I if I hadn't have um, if I hadn't have um, um, you know, been forced by a colleague to try out social media so I could prove it wouldn't work. Um, if you know, if I hadn't have met the um, the, the local you know, Labour team in in North Westminster, and you know, and I suppose the other the other you know, unex, you know, unexpected thing is we we won the election on the fifth of May, which um, was um, required a whole lot of stars to align. I mean, a great many stars required to align to for that result to happen, and. Um, they all did, which is um, which, which, which is why I'm here. Or, or you, you could flip it around and say, uh, if my predecessor hadn't built a large artificial mountain at Marble Arch, I probably wouldn't be here either. Did you go into local government as expecting to be in opposition? You know that, that the role you were taking on was an opposition role without any expectation of uh, uh, of achieving power. Absolutely. I mean, I, I got involved because I wanted to advocate for my my local area um, and. You know, the, the positive thing is that I get to advocate for the you know, much you know, the whole of my local area, which is the whole of the you know, whole of the whole of the borough of Westminster, um, and that's fascinating because it it is you know, I think the most interesting part of London. Um, Six thousand listed buildings, um, you know, World Heritage Site and the Palace of Westminster, um, and a borough of huge contrast. So. Um, the perception in the rest of the country when you say Westminster, they think of the you know, the government, yeah. but actually the borough extends quite a long way north, and um, you know we have some of the areas of uh, highest uh, deprivation in um, in London, if not in in, in the country, uh, alongside huge areas of wealth. I mean, you lose ten years of life expectancy uh, walking across Marylebone Road. Um, that's not going to get hit by a car. It's because the life expectancy in um, in Church, Church Street, Lisson Grove, is lower than it is in Marlborough, and um, that's ridiculous. And, and behind a lot of that uh, is housing. So the um, uh, unemployment's pretty low in Westminster. People are working; they're working hard, often several jobs. Hmm. Um, but it doesn't matter how hard you work uh, on minimum wage; you're not going to be able to. Um, to fall flat. So um, uh, there are clearly a, you know, a bunch of things that we'd love to love to be addressing. I think you know, I mean, you may come onto this, but success for us is, is you know, we've reduced our housing waiting list, uh, but also success for me with the other part of my portfolio we've not really talked about so much uh, with economic development is to, uh, in, to reduce the number of people who are on minimum wage and increase the number who are on London living wage and above. And are in jobs that are fulfilling, um, rewarding, and, and and have prospects because um, there are lots of those in the centre of town, and I would love uh, our residents to be able to um, get a fair crack at them. And obviously, that also you know, builds resilience. We talked about yeah. um, a lot about about during COVID about how you build resilience into the centre of town, uh, and having people working in the centre of town who live you know, in it or close to it um, is actually a pretty key component of that.
What, what are your actual levers to make that happen, Jeff? Well, how can you influence that transition of people from, from lower skilled to higher skilled jobs, from lower paying to, to higher paying jobs? Well, um, one, one of the key ones is through uh, working with the property industry. Um, and there's quite a lot of that already going on. And it's quite heartening talking to, uh, to with one of the big landowners yesterday who's launched in a, a program to um, get people from non-traditional backgrounds into, into property, um, which is a, a, a big sector uh, in, in the West End, but it's tended to recruit from a very narrow base of um, you know, people and we need to broaden that. Um, so that, 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 that's, that's, that's one area, and clearly skills and development is another one. So um, I'd much rather um, we train people to work on Amazon Web Services than we train, train them to, uh, to wait tables. Fair enough. And, and um, the, the, the final part of our, of our interview is, is around your, what you're doing when you're not, when you're not working, um, which is always an odd question for, for a politician, because I know it's a 24 seven job but but what are the the outside interests that you have that maybe shape the way you look at, at what you're doing at West, Westminster um so I mean, you're right we do tend to work 24 7 um and um when, when I'm not 24 7 at politics I'm you know, uh 24 7 in, in you know, the other other kind of business aspects of the, uh, of my life but yeah I play cricket um I play tennis um well, you know, on a Friday night you'll find me at Paddington Sports Club uh, playing tennis on a Sunday afternoon with luck, uh, you'll sit, find me in a, in a village playing uh, playing cricket for the Washington, which is a pub in Belsize Park. Um, I, I can't really say that I, either informs you know my, my work here you know, greatly, but um, you know, it, it's I find it really helpful to switch off when you're playing cricket. It's all you think about is is what you're doing. You, you, everything else is is out. So I, I find it really helpful to help to uh, uh, to clear the mind. How, how long, can I ask how long you've been a, a Maid of Ale resident? How long have you been in Westminster? So um, I, I lived, so I first moved to Westminster when I was um, after university. I mean, all mm -hmm. I knew is I wanted to live in London. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just knew that I had to get here because this is where it's all happening. So um, I shared a flat uh, just next to Westminster Cathedral, uh, just off Victoria Street. Um, and then I went, went, lived on the continent for a few years and, and, and came back to get married. And um, my wife's colleague had a flat to rent in Maidabell, so we rented that. Could have been anywhere, right? Um, but then typical London story, once you start, once you land somewhere, that's where you stay. So I've been this Maidabell since 98, I think. So, yeah, I'm kind of... Uh, 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 that's a kind of mid-career. You know, mid, mid I mean, people have you know, been around for much longer than me. But where, whereabouts did you grow up? Uh, I'm from, uh, well, Chichester is where I was born, um, in, in Sussex, and lived there until I was 13, and then we moved to Southampton, uh, where I did, uh, I lived like 13 to 18, and then went to uh, University of Warwick. And, and I'm interested in um, how, so, so you've grown up in a variety of sort of locations, of types of place, a, 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 a sort of smaller towns and big cities and, and, and lived in London for, for so long. You enjoy playing cricket and the sort of village green kind of idea of a, of a good place. I'm just trying to identify how this sort of shapes how you see, um, you know, good places for people to live and, and, and well, the sorts of places you're trying to create. Well, so you know, a, 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 a 40 minute drive from Maida Bell gets you to um, Great Missenden, mm. uh, just north of High, uh, High Wycombe, where I play cricket on Sunday, which is beautiful. But, you know, that's that's wonderful for the north of High Wycombe, and I'm very glad it's there, but I wouldn't, you know, uh, other than uh, I, I will I will defend the right people to play cricket on Paddington Recreation Ground, um, which you know some, you know, some people don't want cricket there, but you know it's the only pitch we've got in uh, in Westminster. So I'm very keen we keep um, I've got very very keen we we, uh, we keep that and, and access to sport more generally. I think is a, a very good thing. Fantastic. How do you, how do you think Jeff? How do you think your friends would describe you? I've really no idea. I mean, that, that, you're, 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 you're straying into territory where I, I, I've, I've no conception. How would you like them to describe you? <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've no idea. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, um, final question then. Um, what are your? What's the extent of your political ambition? You, you've come into into local government without actually thinking that you were going to be in power, but wanting to influence how things happen. You're now in power. You've got your hands on the levers. How far does your ambition extend? Uh, I, I, this is the extent of my ambition. I mean, I, I'm happy to do this for a you know, couple of years, but um, 
no, I've got, I've got no ambition to do anything uh, uh, and, and, and anything beyond this. It's um, no. <laughs> and, and and when you when you so when you when you leave in a, in a couple of years, perhaps, um, what what do you want to leave behind you? What do you what do you hope your legacy will be? Well, I, I'd, I'd like to have got the um, the changes to the planning policy uh, that we'd like to make. I'd like to get them through. It's just quite a long and involved. Uh, process of of of, you know, of, of, um, of detailed consultation and so on that that would be um, that be really helpful and there's some economic development schemes that we are um, going to be proposing for, for the Harrow Road area of, of North North Westminster which I very much like to see through as well um, which we'll be announcing uh, late later in the year so yeah I mean it would be big, I'm quite outcome focused so I would definitely like to get some um, get some stuff done but appreciate you know in local government things do take uh, uh, do take a, a a while in you know, the best of times. Jeff, on that note, um, and, and speaking of taking a while, we've taken an hour of your, your time, so we need to let you get back to, uh, to, to shaping Westminster and let our viewers get back uh, into their next meetings as well. Um, but uh, please accept my warmest thanks for taking part in, in our live interview. Our voice of authority, uh, Cabinet Member for Planning and Economic Development at the City of Westminster, Councillor Jeff Barraclough. And while the virtual applause is, is ringing out across the internet, um, I'll thank you viewers also for sparing the time to tune in and learn about uh, the man uh, helping to shape the vision for Westminster. Um, now, we're going to be back on the 8th of September in person at Site Match, uh, where councils and development industry can take part in, in, in pre-booked uh, and recorded, Jeff, uh, meetings uh, and networking to start and build the partnerships that can deliver housing and good growth. And that's at the Shard on the 8th of September, and registration details for that are in the chat. And after that, we're going to be with the off-site housing manufacturer, Style House, uh, with special guests to discuss how modern methods of construction can support community land trust aspirations and that's going to be online at 11 a.m on the 15th of september uh, and again details are in the chat and at threefox.co.uk so until then uh, from our voice of authority councillor jeff barraclough from carter jonas and gle and london square partners from me and from everyone at three fox thanks and good afternoon <laughs>